You said earlier that you thought actors, actor directors, were worked better mm. than director directors. Mm. Why? Well, they simply know the process. They know what the process is that the actor has to go through. So you can see somebody having real problems, uh, you know, with a part, and you can make a guess at it because you've gone through there, and there may be something inside. Whereas somebody who hasn't actually acted just sees this as a problem in front of them, and they don't know. They can't help the actor often. You can suggest where the actor might go as a director. Yeah, that's, anybody can do that. Uh, surely he's angry because of this, you'd say. Um, but if you see, you've said, surely he's angry before, because of this, and you see the actor not really being able to deliver the kind of anger that you think is necessary, you have to ask, why? Why, what have I not explained, or what is this person not able to do? And if it's something integral to them that they can't quite be, can't find an honest way of dealing with this moment, you have to find something else for them that they can honestly buy into. And that's an acting thing. That's, a, that's something that you can guess at rather than seeing. A non-actor director will tend to see things, tend to accept what's given to them as a, a as an almost half-finished product, not a process. The, the actor can recognize a process more easily than the, the non-acting director. Does that leave out highly conceptual directors of intelligence or vision? Or? No, no, not at all. Because, um, for instance, I, I mean, the two directors really who were doing most of the jobs at Shaw were myself and Neil Monroe. Both of us mm -hmm. were actors. Mm -hmm. um, and both of us have been known as conceptual directors at various times. So we managed to balance both. But take someone like John Hirsch, mm. who is inspirational in a way and has given us some product, gave us some productions that were extraordinary. But his knowledge of uh, Desmond Healy said it to me after he had, you know, he he had said to me, you know, two days before we had our first audience, and I was doing Mary Stewart. He said, "Bob, Bob, when I watch what you're doing up there and think we have an audience in two days, I want to shit myself." Mm. And he, as you said, he had no tool with which to help me. He just, I remained spinning outside of Saturn, as it were. And he, I remember I went to Desmond Healy, was a designer, a designer and Martha and, and Douglas, and they said, you have to understand, he, he actually doesn't know how the theater works. He knows what he likes, he has a vision, but the actual process that you're talking about, he doesn't have. No, he couldn't do it. He, d he didn't know. You, uh, I was quite good as an actor for him um, because I, I I was going to say I didn't need the help. That's stupid. I could have been much better if he'd been able to give me a little bit more help. But I usually could give him something in the area of what he needed. Uh, that, um, what did I play for him? I played an Oberon for him, and I, I, I could do what he needed at the time. I did Aramis in The Three Musketeers and various other bits. I, I could give him what he needed, but I could see people who weren't giving him what he needed and he couldn't get through them. I, I remember this quite vividly at times. And, and very simple things. I remember Martha, as Lady de Winter in The Three Musketeers, way back in the 60s, saying, oh, that's dreadful I have to say that those lines about, I am too young to die, that's ridiculous. I remember saying to her, because she was playing Tania, so we were very close at the time, Martha, Martha, that's the most wonderful line to be able to say, I am too young to die. You, you, chances are you'll get a huge laugh, but the audience will go with you. Now, looking back on it, I realized that what was happening to me was that I was slowly becoming a director. Uh -huh. um, but um, John would not have been able to say, from an actor's point of view, listen, you'll get a laugh and do this, 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 it's fun. He would, he would see it as part of this vision that she should come on and say, I'm too young to die. That's what he wanted. He wasn't thinking of what happens inside the actor and the actor's response, the response that the actor gets from the audience. He was very interesting with John Hirsch because I loved his conceptions. I thought they were mad half the time, but they worked, you know, they were great things. And then there were terrible things that just didn't work, you know, with him. But he was, 
Oh, he was an enthusiast, and so am I. Uh, I could listen to John Hirsch talk. Oh, he's fantastic. Time. Yes, he was wonderful. Yeah. It, would just, it would just pour out of him, like ideas. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? What about this? And he was marvelous. Let's talk a little bit, speaking about John Hirsch, uh, let's talk a little bit about arts advocacy. Hmm. Um, in that one of my impressions of Hirsch, uh, in the very positive side of the ledger, was him talking to a, a, I don't know, a group of city councillors or something, and talking about theater and art and why we were doing it and why there was a responsibility from them to help. And it triggered something in me and um, made sense to me. How much do we, and you have been an arts advocate, I've seen you, I've seen you mm. go after bureaucrats in mm. a way that I yes. admired. <laughs> How much of our job is being advocates for the art? As much as you can afford to give, it's still necessary to explain what we do. It's still necessary now um, because I'm older and the world that I came from and that is you learn as a boy is not the world that is out there on the street now. I was talking to a, a group of kids at the University of Victoria two weeks ago and I was so conscious of the fact that here are all these 20 year olds or late teenagers listening to me who all have cell phones, who all operate computers you know, they know how to file things. And uh, I don't. You know, I go, oh God, what is this application that I have to use, you know, here? And I don't have a cell phone. I don't want to be contacted if I'm walking down the street. You know, I don't even want to be contacted if I'm at home half the time uh, because I wasn't brought up. A, a, a letter is kind of nice with me and I can put it on one side for two years and then I'll answer it. You know, that's about my, my level. And I'm very, I was very conscious of these, uh, of these uh, kids being in a totally different world. But what's interesting is I tried to say to them, theater uses time as its media. What we, we, we use, if you come see me perform, you buy for whatever it costs to see me, you buy two and a half hours of that time. You, you set it aside to sit in a nice chair, hopefully, and watch this interesting thing. It's about buying a chunk of time. And uh, the intriguing thing is that my, how I vis envisage time is different from the, how the kids envisage time now and how they use it. I mean, they're, they're, they can concentrate for three and a half minutes because they've been brought up on music music which lasts usually about three and a half minutes. That's intense concentration. Probably more than I would give in those, the old days, but in that three and a half minutes, they're right in there. But after three and a half minutes, it, 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 it shifts again. It, their concentration can go. So, so they're different, how they use time. And I was saying to them, the amazing thing is, here I am speaking to you, and we're up both in this one hour i.e. it's my hour, it's your hour. So I was trying to get them to think about what the nature of time and how theatre exists in this time. Uh, but you're really talking about arts ad advocacy. It's still it's start. advocacy to, uh, where we advocate not only to the pol politicians, not only to the, the, the people we will get the money for who must support us, but we're also advocating to the generations coming behind us. Yes, yes. And we have an older art form. Yes. A very old, a very old art form, which fewer, it's important for fewer people than it used to be, say, in the 19th century, as the only one. It doesn't mean it's less important. It really doesn't. If to join in a live concert is always exciting, more exciting than listening to it on a CD. To, to actually be part of a good theatre presentation is, is amazingly exciting. It still is. And by doing that, by being part of that, by, as an audience, giving of ourselves and opening ourselves, we gain something. We gain another view of the world. That's what we gain in the theater. We see a parallel universe which connects with our own. It's so let's take the advocacy to both ends of that ladder, to the, to the younger generation, or the generation of iPods and and cell phones and the rest of it. How 
because we'll only survive if enough of them come into the oh, theater yes. and want it as a form. How do we do that? Well, just it, it, it's, it's very simple. It's getting easier and easier. You can text message anybody. You can, you can find your group. You can find the people who are interested in this and maybe will have some interest in this. It's, this is what's wonderful about the modern world is the speed of communication and the fact that you can sort through the groups who are interested in this. You can, you can find groups who are interested in anything. I mean, I'm interested in, I mean, I'm interested in topiary, cutting little bushes into shapes. Like, it's pretty esoteric. I mean, they did it in the Elizabethan times and they've always done cut bushes into shapes. But it's a pretty peculiar thing to be interested in. Mm -hmm. But all I have to go is type in topiary and I will find the American Topiary Society, and I will find so and so and so. I can find a group of people who are interested in this. Um, so you can with the theater, and it's big. But in terms of, of a generation of, again, of short attention spans and a multiplicity of sort of media outlets, do we alter what we do in the theater to make sure it's applicable to them and their mirror and their imagination? Or do we say, no, you must develop longer attention spans to listen to Man and Superman and, and to see uh, Enemy the People? No, you recognize what's happening to them. You recognize what's happening to an audience. You must take into account, I think, in the theater, what is the nature of the audience. What is worrying them? What is troubling them? How they, how they organize their time? You must, you must be in the world be able to give to this modern audience. You must sense it. I, I'm saying I don't have a cell phone, which is a bit, you know, it's, it's not Luddite. It's just I, 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 I'm not against people using cell phones. It's fine. It just doesn't fit with my life, uh, or it doesn't seem to need to. Um, but you must recognize that it's there. And but modern, modern writing in, for the theater, the, the scenes have gotten shorter yeah. and shorter and shorter, yes. and there's fewer and fewer people in them, which is a more televised version of theater writing. Do we keep up with this? This is a response to you know, multiple, uh, multiple distractions and shorter attention spans. Well, you just recognize that it's there, so that when you're doing Man and Superman, You've got to recognize that the attention span sometimes of the audience is shorter. It, it may mean cutting a few things. I mean, not against that. Shaw wrote enormously, like he, he wrote for an audience which was happy sitting there for three and a half hours. Our audience is not. About three hours is just about the max that most of our audience can take. Uh, so you recognize this. You recognize also that they, they will look at a piece differently. Uh, the example that I've been given I've been giving recently is just our, our, the understanding of language. We, we talk about hanging up the phone because it's just, it just means putting down the phone. We don't actually go hanging up the phone. I haven't hung up a phone for eight. Well, of course one hasn't since one used a candlestick phone, you know, that you press to your ear and then hung it up. But we've kept the phrase. Yeah. So it, it's, it's a matter of knowing, knowing what connects at what time. So uh, I, as a younger person, I remember trying to convince, when I was at the University of Leeds, that they were going to do a Hamlet, uh, I don't know, the theatre society as it was, because it wasn't a department, and I, I wanted to direct it, so there was, I, I had ideas about Hamlet doing to be or not to be, and I was shaving. I remember this was, uh, when I floated this idea, they thought that was ridiculous, and uh, we weren't going to do that. So we never got it. But I always wanted to be or not to be, to be, I wanted a blade. I wanted something dangerous so that we actually do know what the meaning of the lines are. Mm -hmm. Because we, we skim over meaning often. You accept, like hanging up the phone, one accepts to be or not to be, that is the question. You don't actually go to be living or not to be. Does that mean I could just stop? Well, you know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. It's the, it's the exploration of the text. So you, you have to somehow make that exploration of the text interesting to the people who are going to spend their 25 bucks or 100 bucks now. And that challenge just changes according to the kind of imagination, imaginative landscape of the generation who you're trying to get into the theater. And what country you're in and uh, yeah. all the, the mores of that, that culture. Yes.